say, yes, I'm Alistair from the University of Leeds, and that is the title of my talk this morning. So to start with, uh, what is the rationale behind this study? So as Caitlin mentioned before, I think we're all in consensus that plays are going to be a big part of meeting the demand for supplementary cementitious materials in the coming decades. And part of that, as Caitlin also mentioned, is drive towards using lower purity plays and uh, more min mineralogically complex, complex plays, otherwise known as common clays in general. So one of the barriers to using, using a greater variety of these plays is that whilst thermal activation, i.e. calcination, is known to be very effective for kaolinitic plays, typically it's less effective for two to one plays. So the question is, can alternative activation routes help us with this? So in this study, we did a comparison of thermal and mechanochemical activation for two commercial bentonites, which is a relatively simple starting point to quite a big and complex question. So to start with, in case anyone's not familiar with the concept of mechanochemical activation, you can kind of simply describe it like this. Through repeated physical impacts, we get both amorphization of the clay mineral's crystal structure as well as dehydroxylation, i.e. the same effects that we get from thermal treatment, albeit through physical means. The most common way to achieve this is planetary ball milling, and that was what we used in this study. So as you can see on this diagram here, we have clay particles along with grinding balls, typically stainless steel, in, and they are rotated in a planetary fashion at quite a high speed. So the result is we get repeated physical impacts between the clay particles, the grinding balls, and the vessel walls, leading to those structural changes I mentioned before. So as I mentioned, using use two bentonites in this uh, study, and conveniently, um, they are the same two bentonites that Caitlin has used in her studies. So one is, as you mentioned, one is a sodium bentonite, the other is a calcium bentonite, roughly similar purity. And the associated minerals are uh, listed here, but what you'd expect in terms of quartz, feldspars, mitres, and other siliceous minerals. So for the activation treatments themselves, thermal, used one hour at 830 degrees C, again, same as, same as Caitlin. Uh, this was chosen as it was about 50 degrees C above the end of the hydroxylation range, identified by a thermogravimetry. I've listed the conditions used for the planetary ball milling here. These were based on a previous study, which was shown to be effective for a range of different plates. So, I'm going to try and address four different questions in the rest of this talk, starting with how do both of these treatments affect the structure and chemistry of these minerals? We're starting with some powder XRD patterns. We can see that both treatments result in the disappearance of the 001 sodium monoclonalite peak. There's something that's different between the treatments is if we look to the peaks at 20 degrees DP. So in the calcined samples pattern in the middle, that peak is still present. In the mill sample, it's absent, absent. And this suggests that milling achieves more comprehensive description of structural order, given that it, it, this suggests it would get disorder in the uh, A, B, and C crystallographic axes rather than just the C axis. Now looking at the calcium bentonites, Overall, the broad, the broad trends are pretty much the same. So whilst we don't get complete elimination of that calcium monoclonalite peak, both treatments significantly reduce its intensity. And we have the same observation for the peak of 20 degrees to the as well. So comparing the two bentonites, in terms of X-ray, XRD structure, sorry, in terms of what we can learn for the structure about XRD, the trends are broadly the same. So digging a little bit more deep, digging a little bit deeper, we can use aluminium solid state NMR. So starting again with the sodium bentonites, 
we can see that both treatments result in a reduction in the proportion of aluminium in six-fold coordination. And we can see that by the reduction in intensity of the peak at around zero ppm. And this suggests that we get complete or near complete dehydroxylation from both of these treatments. Now looking at the calcium bentonite, the overall trend is the same. We get a significant, re significant reduction in the six-fold coordination. The difference being there's still some intense intensity remaining. So dehydroxylation is perhaps not fully complete. But interestingly for the calcium bentonites, there is a clear difference between the calcined and the milled spectra. If we look at around 30 ppm, we can see that there's a peak there, which seems, which we would say is uh, due to aluminium in five-fold coordination. And this is significant because the literature suggests that the amount of aluminium in five-fold coordination is quite influential in determining the activity. We'll come back to that later. The second question I'll address is around a moisture distribution. So perhaps not the, not the thing of highest interest, but it's, it is quite interesting because of how different the behaviors are between the two treatments. So looking at the differential TG curves here on the right, the sodium bentonites. After calcination, both the mass, locks, mass loss peaks for structural hydroxyls and surface of the water um, almost completely disappear. So there's negligible moisture in that system. In milling, there's a similar effect with the structural hydroxyls, that, that mass loss peak is, is lost, but there is a, still a broad surface absorbed water peak. So a clear difference there between the calcine sample. Now looking at FTIR spectra at the high, enough, the high wave number range, again, starting with the calcine samples spectrum, we can see there's negligible intensity for the absorption bands associated with both structural hydroxyls and water, consistent with TG. And if we look at the milled sample, again, negligible intensity for the structural hydroxyls, but we get a broad surface absorbed water band. So the question is, why is there such a difference in terms of moisture between these two plates? We believe the the explanation is due to uh, the nature of the systems themselves. So in calcination, we have an, a laboratory furnace for which air passes through. It's an open system. So when moisture is evolved by dehydroxylation, it's able to escape from the system. In contrast, the milling system used here, it uses a closed vessel, tightly closed. So whilst moisture is evolved through dehydroxylation, Ultimately, it has nowhere to go. It remains in the system and is ultimately redistributed onto clay mineral surfaces, albeit with a broader range of activation energies due to the disordered structure. So thirdly, how do these treatments affect the physical side of things, i.e. size and morphology? So here we're looking at um, particle size distribution curves obtained by laser diffraction and also specific surface area values obtained by nitrogen absorption. So starting with the sodium bentonites, we can see that calcination increases the particle size distribution and also decreases surface area. In other words, it's coarsened, which isn't altogether surprising for calcine and clays of this kind of range. This is pretty well known. Looking then at the milled clay, we can see the particle size distribution gets smaller, that, that curve shifts to the left. But at the same time, we also get a slight reduction in the specific surface area. Now, this is somewhat counterintuitive, right? If we get smaller particles, we'd expect them to have a smaller specific surface area. So we'd expect them to have a larger specific surface area. So what is going on? To answer, let's have a look at some SEM images. So compared to the precursor here, if we have a look at the calcine clay, I mean, you can't read too much into this, but ultimately there's no dramatic changes observed in particle size or morphology. It looks somewhat similar. In contrast, milling seems to make the particles both smaller and more spheroidal or less plate-like in, in nature. So this explains what we observed earlier from the bulk techniques. If we're getting 
particles which have a lower aspect ratio, this explains how they can become smaller and also have a smaller specific surface area at the same time. The practical significance of this is that you'd expect this to be beneficial for workability. Um, and this is, as Caitlin demonstrated, this is something that can be problematic for some Caitlin for some calcined clays. So lastly, probably the question of most interest, how does all this affect reactivity? So here, use the calorimeter methods of the R3 test, as Caitlin previously explained. And so, yeah, on the, the center here, we have heat release curves for the sodium benzoate plates. So speaking quite colloquially, we can describe the heat release behavior of the calcined clay as being kind of slow and steady. And in contrast, the milled clay being very short and sharp, a very intense initial heat release curve that drops off quickly. The same story is told if we plot cumulative evolved heats. So despite the fact that they have somewhat similar total evolved heat at seven days, the rate at which they get there is very different. Now looking at the calcium bentonites, the overall trends between them are the same as we saw previously in terms of the slow and steady versus short and sharp. However, here, the calcined clay is you know, perhaps a little substantially more reactive. So one possible explanation which could be a contributing factor to this is what we saw earlier in the NMR results. A greater proportion of aluminium in fivefold coordination in the calc science play could be expected to lead to uh, greater reactivity. So lastly, I've plotted here those seven day heat release values for all the samples we've discussed here. And using a bit of a sneak peek, I'm gonna use the uh, reactivity classifications specifically for calcine plays developed by the Rylem TCTRM. So, from that work, it was statistically derived that the threshold for moderately reactive calcine phase with 90% confidence is greater than 190 joules per gram of SCM. So all the treated phase here seem to meet that. We can classify them as being moderately reactive. However, they're still well below the threshold for highly reactive, even with, with just a 66% confidence value. That's up at 800 joules per gram. So I think from this work so far, we've made, found some interesting observations in terms of the different behaviors between those activation methods. But of course, those differences will be uh, a combination of both chemical and physical effects at the same time. So to try and dig into more detail into those relationships and identify the most influential factors, we'll be undertaking some more detailed characterization and also extending this comparative study to a wide range of modes. I'd like to finish by uh, thanking my colleagues and funders from both the UK and the US. And we thank you for your attention and we'd gladly take any questions that you may have. Great, thank you so much, Alistair, for a fascinating talk, lots of detailed analysis there. Um, we, um, so we've got a couple questions in the chat. Let me um, grab one of them. Um, Pranoya, I asked your question last time, so I'm gonna let him answer that one in writing um, in the Q&A. I'll go to um, Ulshan Kenbeck, uh, the Georgia Tech. This is great talk, Alistair. Do you think increasing the sphericity of calcine clays with milling is a general trend or can it be manipulated or controlled with different milling methods? Um, I would say, I'd say it's definitely the, the latter. So I think an unanswered question in the, the mineralogy as well as cement literature in general is we don't, in my opinion, don't have quite a good understanding of the effects that different milling geometries and machineries have on these kind of things. So this is a, a large-scale planetary bore mill. The distribution of forces and loading on that is different to a 200-ton um, sort of horizontal roller bore mill. So there's an open question in terms of to what extent these um, observations are universal or specific to both conditions and also the milling geometry. So this is something that yeah, we'd quite like to investigate in the future. Great. Thank you so much.